We're going to move on to robotics, kind of the core, the, the, the thesis, the heart, the soul, the blood of RobotsConf. Um, last year's robotics was presented by Pavel, and I think he presented the Terminator and how to kill everybody, which was a little bit weird. He's here over there right now. Uh, he'll be on with the hacker spaces. Um, this year we have Robotics 101, brought to you by Raquel Velez, and uh, I'll let you take it over from there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I need a little more energy. Woo! Woo! That's right. Robots! Oh, my god. Uh, so my name is Raquel Velez, as Chris said. Uh, I am a senior software developer at NPM Inc. Uh, if you write JavaScript, you've probably heard of NPM. We're the package manager for all things JavaScript. Uh, and. Uh, well, I've been doing software development for like almost three years now. Uh, I've also been a roboticist, and I've been doing robotics for over a decade. And uh, I'll show you like kind of some of my robots or whatever. Uh, but my goal for this talk is to kind of give you an overview of robotics in general. Uh, I don't want to go too far deep into anything, uh, but by all means, ask me questions later, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get started. What is a robot? What is a robot? I don't know. We see these things in our everyday lives, right? We've got robots at home. We've got robots in industry. We've got robots of the future. And it's, it's kind of awesome. But how many of you kind of think that this is super daunting and a little out of reach for the average person? Yeah. It's, it's, that's pretty daunting. Uh, and. Absolutely. Like, this is one of the first robots I ever worked on, and I was totally blown away by what that meant and what I was working on. And I was working on such a tiny piece, and it didn't even really, I don't know. Anyway, but let's, let's take the things a step back. Robot has an actual definition. Don't read this whole thing, because that's too much. Here's a nice highlighted version. A robot is just a machine that is programmable by a computer. All right, let's repeat that. A robot is a machine that is programmable by a computer. That's it. That's it. There's not anything more than that. It's very simple. And you're like, uh, what do you mean by that, Raquel? Let me show you a few examples. This is a simple circuit. Somebody is using an Arduino to light an LED. Hopefully, all of you have done this already. And if not, if you do not leave, you, are, you may not leave RobotsConf until you do this, just so you know. I will, I will physically stand in your way until you get this done. Uh, but this is a robot. This is just connecting an LED to an Arduino and turning it on and off. Very simple, but still a robot. Of course, things get a little bit more complex over time. You can build these robots that draw things, that play cool games. You don't even have to build anything, necessarily. You can take something. And like, you don't have to break it from scratch. This is a crazy fly. It comes in a kit. You can put that together and then program it. You can take something that's already been built for you. This is an AR drone. We have a bunch in the room next door. This is also a robot, right? So all of these things are just machines that are programmable with a computer. Very simple. These are robots. Now you know what your task is. Go in a little bit deeper. What is what consists of like what do you need in order for it to like have robot parts? What are robot parts? Let's let's dissect that. So we have a robot has some major components. We have the chassis, which holds all of the robot bits together, right? We've got the intelligence part, which are really just the computers. The computers can either be on board or off board. It doesn't really matter, uh, but there does need to be some sort of computer. That's that whole machine programmable by a computer piece. Uh, we'll also need sensors. Sensors take information from the outside world, and then actuators, which allow us to kind of interact with the outside world. Does that make sense? So a sensor takes in information, and an actuator spits out movement or something. This might sound very similar to, I don't know, a human being. We have a body, which holds all the meat bits together instead of metal. We've got uh, intelligence. Some ha may have more than others. 
Um, not true, you are all super smart, I promise. Uh, we have sensors, which are like our eyes, our ears, our nose, our fingers. And we have actuators, our hands, our arms, our legs, moving through space and time. We are robots. Not really, because we're not programmable by a computer. Ha. OK. So there are three different categories of robots as well. These are, it's a kind of a gradient, but like it's not totally siloed between each one. But let's get into them. There are remote controlled robots. These are robots where a human is involved, and a human, the human makes all of the decisions. The robot makes no decisions on its own. It's completely the human, right? So what are examples of that? You have your RC cars, you have your CNC machines, your 3D printers, you have your very simple LED in a circuit, et cetera. So these are remote controlled. There's no machine decision making, but they're still programmable by by a computer, so they still count as robots. Then you've got the semi-autonomous robots, right? These have some human, but also some machine decision making. So in this case, you have, let's say, a human kind of involved, but then the machine is also making some of its own decisions on its own. Some examples. Uh, the Da Vinci medical robot. This is the sort of robot that a doctor will go in and be on one side and be all like, okay, I'm going to make incisions and do doctory things here. And then there's the robot that's like taking all that information and doing it better, right? So in this case, a human is involved making all the decisions about where to put the incision, where to point everything. I'm not, I'm not obviously not a doctor. I'm like, <laughs> medical terminology. <laughs> uh, but what's nice about the Da Vinci robot is that what it does is it dampens everything. So whereas a human doctor will have a little bit of, you know, oopsie daisies uh, with their hands, the robot will dampen all of those jitters and will make it nice and smooth and everything is nice and precise. Uh, similarly, the Mars rover, how does that work? Well, a human says, hey, look, there's a rock over there. Get me a sample. Then the robot says, OK, there's a sample. I have taken your instruction. But I see in front of me that there is, to my left, boiling lava. I don't know if there's actually lava on Mars, whatever. But there's like really bad terrain here. There's a big hole in the middle. But on the right, it's smooth sailing. So I'm going to go to the right and figure that out. It might take me a little bit longer, but you only told me where to go, not when to go. So I'm going to take my time. And uh, what's nice about that is that it means that the robot can kind of take on some of the more menial tasks of making sure it doesn't die and making sure that uh, everything is nice and dampened and whatever. That's the beauty. Another example is the AR drone as well. And then finally, we have the autonomous robots. These are the ones where it's very little human decision making and almost entirely machine de decision making. So unfortunately, there aren't very many examples of completely, totally, perfectly autonomous robots right now. Uh, believe it or not, it's a really hard problem to solve. And I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but there are some examples, and there are some pieces of other robots that are pretty good examples. So your thermostat, specifically the Nest thermostat, is perfectly autonomous. This is one of the beautiful, like most beautiful, perfectly autonomous robots, and we've had it for ages, right? What does it do? You say, I want to set it to x degrees, and then this robot says, OK, well, we're currently at x plus y. So let's put on the cooling. We're at x minus y. Let's put on the heater, et cetera, et cetera. And it does everything nice and perfectly for you. All you do is you give it input, and then it figures everything else on its own, assuming it works, which you know, sometimes it does. Uh, <laughs> another example would be like the Google self-driving car. This isn't the Google one. This is Team Caltech, but still, the idea is Ideally, it would be making all of its own decisions perfectly. But as you may have noticed, there are really big buttons on the side and inside and uh, off-site that stop it because they're not quite perfect yet. So if you ever get the chance, sit in one of these cars because it's really cool sitting in the driver's seat and not touching the steering wheel. Super awesome. Uh, of course, then there's also the autopilot on airplanes. The autopilot itself is fairly autonomous. but we still need humans involved in takeoff and landing. 
for good reason, but we'll get to that. So just to kind of recap, you have your three different types of robots, and they're a gradient between how much human control and how much robot control there is. Is this all, is this all making sense? Cool, yeah, excellent. All right, so that's it. That's all there is to robotics. We can all go home, but I still have 11 minutes. So let's talk about the three hardest problems in robotics, in my opinion. Ever ask, ask like 10 roboticists what the hardest problems in robotics are, you're gonna get 10 different answers. This one's just fine. Uh, to keep in mind, you're going to see these, and eventually you're going to actually start dealing with these. And I want you to keep in mind that this is actually the part that makes robotics really, really cool, right? They are really hard problems, but they're also kind of the coolest problems. And I don't want you to get frustrated. I want you to see it as you are breaking new ground into the wild, wild west of robotics, and oh my goodness, what can you make with this? All right, cool. Uh, so, the first one is data collection. What does that mean? The idea is that you have these sensors, but how do you know that the information coming through those sensors is useful? That's a really hard problem to solve, right? Because there's all the signal, but then there's also noise, and you can mitigate it with spec sheets and drivers and making sure that you've got the best sensors out there, but at the same time, maybe you need to be a low-level expert doing more electrical engineering type stuff to make sure that the, the hardware you're putting out there has the best signal-to-noise ratio and all that stuff. Uh, for example, this is a LADAR image of a forest. I don't know if that's what you originally thought when you saw it, but now that I told you it was a forest, you can probably see it, right? There's the yellow bits, which are the tops of the trees, and the kind of bluish, blackish bits, which are the forest floor. And you can see, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense. How do you get a machine to understand that? Well, you say, okay, the, picture, the colors are actually just numerical values and all that stuff, da 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 da. But then, what happens when your environment changes? Fun story, uh, if you have a LADAR, mounted to an autonomous car in a parking lot, well, everything looks nice and flat for a long time, right? Because it's a parking lot, there, and there are no cars, right? So empty parking lot, massive parking lot, it's just free sailing, great. Then it rains. How does a LADAR work? A LADAR is basically a laser radar, and so you have these laser beams that are just light that go out, and then it hits something and then reflects back and the amount of time that it takes for it to come back is how we decide how far something is. Well, add puddles into the mix, and all of a sudden, things are reflecting in different ways. And now, this car that's, walking, that's riding around this massive uh, parking lot thinks that there are walls everywhere. So it does, in, whereas before it was just kind of like walking around, no problem, now it's walking and stopping, and oh my goodness, and then, oh, hold up, no, 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 no. That's kind of a hard problem to solve, because now this wonderful sensor that you had no longer works when it's raining outside. If it's Southern California, that's one thing, but if you're in Portland, right? So this is a really tough problem to solve. The second one is this idea of state. When we think about state, we think about where is the robot at this time? And it's more than just location. We think, okay, state. I am in the conference room at the front of the stage next to the podium, but I'm also speaking at a certain number of words per minute, and I'm facing in a certain direction right now, and I'm now it's a different direction now. Uh, there are people in front of me, there are some empty tables and some not empty tables. All of that contributes to state. So if you think about it in terms of a robot, a robot needs to understand not only where it is, how fast it's going, how fast it's accelerating, what else is in its environment, what does it need to worry about. All of these things contribute to state. And figuring out how that all plays together is really difficult. There's this concept called SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And it's really cool because the idea is, if I have a map of my environment, then I will always know where I am. But when you walk into a room for the first time, you still have to build that map for the first, in the first place. And how do you do that? Well, at any given time, you have to walk in, and you 
build a bit of map from what you can see, and then you move, and then you try to add on to the map, and then you move again, you add on to the map some more until you complete the map. But if you look at this picture, right, all we have is a robot in a box, well, in a rectangle, and yet this does not look like a rectangle. Does it look like a rectangle to y'all? It does not look like a rectangle. It's because this robot state is not quite figured out. So th this robot will never say, OK, my, my understanding of the environment is complete, and therefore you will never have a fully understanding of state. And this can all be fixed in some ways with common filters and other mathematical algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, but it's still a really hard problem to solve. And figuring out how to do this, not only by land, but by air and by sea, and all sorts of other things makes it really tough. Third problem is sensor fusion. This one is, to me, the biggest problem in robotics that I've ever seen. And it's really a combination of the first two, right? It's this idea of combining data collection with state. How does that work? OK, well, let's, let's think about this. We have an autonomous car trying to drive around a city environment. Well, it has a whole bunch of sensors, right? It's got cameras and lidars and radars and touch sensors and color vision and stereo vision and IR and everything, plus temperature sensors and trying to understand the speed limit and everything else. And at the same time, it needs to stop so that it doesn't hit the other car. So how do you balance all of these sensors? And even just think about it from a programmatic standpoint, right? Like we, do we keep each sensor on its own thread and then take in all the data from each sensor and then kind of mash it together in some identifiable way? But then what if the sensor is noisy, right? How do you, how do you take out all of the signal from that and make sure that the signal from all of the sensors is as best as possible and time it so that at any given point you know exactly what's going on. And then on top of that, fully make sure that you still have all the power requirements to keep all of those things going and make sure your bot's not too heavy so you're falling through the ground or you know, it just keeps mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting. This is a hard problem to solve. How many of you are a little nervous now that I said all of these things? It's a little nerve wracking. <laughs> I don't want you to be nervous. Again, like I said, I want you to see these problems as an interesting, interesting problem to solve. Because here's the fun thing. As, as Adrian said earlier today, it used to be that all of the people who worked in robotics had PhDs. Now, I'm not going to speak for everybody here. But I am going to bet quite a lot of money that not every single person in this room or at this conference has a PhD. I know, I know. I might be betting the farm. Uh, which means to me that this is a really, really cool opportunity because you're all here playing with robots. Which also means that you are embarking on really cool, unknown, in an unknown field that's not, it's kind of known, but not very well known. And you have this opportunity to kind of play around and see what you come up with without all of the academia and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because I'm, now I really will probably bet the farm on this one. I bet the people who solve these problems are not necessarily going to be PhDs. So go out there, build something, solve these problems, let me know what you come up with. I will be around, ask questions. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So the question was, can I talk about some of the kind of more readily available hardware that can handle some of these more advanced robotics concepts? Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, so I've been playing around with just the Arduino, and I've come, I haven't gotten too far with, uh, with trying to figure out state, et cetera. But that has a lot to do with just lack of computational tools, right? So like a lot of this hard stuff comes down to math and algorithms and processing. Uh, I, I do have a robot that, for example, takes information from like a sonar and parses that information and plays, it, plays around with it. I haven't added more sensors than that. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I know some people have had more success with like a BeagleBone Black because it has more ports and it has a little bit more onboard power. 
Uh, same thing with the Arduino Yoon, because it has an onboard computer, whereas the Arduino Uno is kind of, you use your external computer as your, as your main system. Um, so this is even more, like we're still just figuring this stuff out. I'm pretty excited about it, but I, I unfortunately can't really give you more than that. Uh, I think you can do a lot with the Raspberry Pi, but again, it comes down to figuring out exactly how to handle all of these different things. Because I'm playing around in Node.js land, which is single-threaded. So that whole threading question is a totally new idea. And like, in, in the sense of we don't do threading, so then how do we take all of the sensor information and try to like parse everything together? That's going to be like my ultimate goal over time. So a little exciting. <laughs> so the difference between Arduino, so the Arduino Uno is a microcontroller but it doesn't have an onboard computer. So what that makes it basically means is if you're going to come up with a program that sends something to it, it's going to be pre-formatted, pre-computed, everything, and you just kind of send commands to it, like, like turn this on, turn this off, whatever. With something with a Linux on board, then you have a, a little bit more opportunity to kind of open up sockets and start talking, to, talking back and forth with the machine as, as you like, there's a lot more communication going on. So you can have a little bit more control in a sense of saying, okay, well, let's get all of this information, pass it over the IP or whatever to another computer or whatever. There's, there are many more opportunities with, some, with a, a microcontroller with like c computing on board than with just a simple microcontroller. Does that answer your question? Excellent. All right, that's my time. Thank you so much.